We often refer to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 when we're talking about the beginning of the Lord's church on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many times we do that to talk about various aspects of the church. But I want to focus in on verse 42 this morning or this afternoon. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. I want us to focus in on that latter part that it was customary, it was traditional in the sense of that's what godly people did, what God instructed them to do when it came to the church, to continue in prayer. So we're talking about one aspect of worship whenever we petition the Father. So we want to study how to pray effectively. Effectively. By effectively, we mean adequate to accomplish a purpose, producing the intended or expected result. So we want to engage in prayer for the reasons it was given for us to participate in. In order, therefore, to pray effectively to God, to accomplish a purpose that prayer was given to us to accomplish, we must understand the character, the circumstance, the content, and the results of our prayers to God. Now, I need not say, but will for emphasis, that of course we do all things as Jesus has authorized us to do. And when we study the New Testament on anything, then we're seeking the will of the Lord for our lives. So following this particular study, the listener should be able to pray at least more effectively to God, both in public prayer, such as in this worship assembly, or in our private prayers, wherever we may engage in them. So the sermon sets forth the basic concept of prayer. And it will be examined with the end result in us, hopefully, that brethren will know how to pray more effectively. If you look at chapter 2, you will notice beginning in verse 24 that Peter is preaching, and Luke records whom God hath raised up, speaking of Christ, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I might pause here and say hell here, better rendered Hades the place of departed spirits. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy, with thy countenance. Many brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So when you see he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, that lets us know that we have one who, as Paul wrote to Timothy, is the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. That he ever liveth, as the writer of Hebrews said, to make intercession for us. So how can we pray with the same fervency and effectiveness today? We are the Lord's church and members in particular. Well, in answering the question, we must understand what's involved in praying fervently. 
we must understand the character of the petitions we as God's children offer to Him. And that brings up the question, what is prayer? Well, I partially answered it when I used the word petition as a synonym for prayer. Paul wrote to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I would like to break down what Paul said to Timothy to help us better understand what we're doing in this lesson as children of God in learning better how to pray, that is, to pray effectively. The word supplications that's employed by the Holy Spirit here, the Greek word indicates reverence before the one who deserves it. And if God does not deserve our reverence toward Him, when we approach Him as His children to speak to Him, then who does? It was used in situations where questions were actually made or presented to kings themselves. There is sometimes a flippancy and a lightheartedness that some have fallen into when it comes to approaching God in prayer. Now, we know physically that we're not coming before God in the sense of He's physical too. But we know we're speaking spiritually, and yet what we do spiritually is seen in our outward actions. Let me comment on this as a side comment I hear this business of spiritual activity as if it's something that goes on only I say only in the mind well it certainly begins there and I don't think anybody can be quote spiritual unquote in anything unless it begins in the mind the inward man where your spirit is or your spirit is therefore involved in it in service to God or whatever it is that we do in service to him but we must remember that whatever goes on in our heart is manifested in our body. Our bodies are to be presented as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. So when people just say, well, I'm, well let me give you an example. Uh, I heard a fellow say one time that he wouldn't sing or he didn't sing because he couldn't sing too well. So he just sat there and made no, no action or no move to actually engage in the physical act of singing. He said, I just sat and worshiped God in my heart. Well, I'm not speaking of the person that doesn't have a tongue or a voice box or has some sort of malady that won't let him sing. But God didn't say, now, if you've got a trained voice for singing and it's more beautiful than anybody else, then you can worship me. The point is, is that you can't just worship God in your heart. There are acts of worship. The physical act of worship is involved. Now, it must come from the heart, and the heart must be guided by the Lord's will. So it's not just sitting there worshiping your heart. And uh, it's got to be understood that it's a matter of giving acts of worship. I'm not saying you can't utter a prayer in your mind to God, known only to you and God. Pray to God. I think that goes on in any faithful children of God's life where in your mind you can speak to God. I'm glad it's that way. You may sometimes just say, Oh, Father, give me strength to persevere. Uh, help me. Whatever. I think I remember one time when David was running from King Saul that he prayed while he was running up a hill to get away from him. We can pray to God any time as long as our heart's right toward him. But at the same time, when it comes to serving God, there are actions that are involved and when it comes to our singing or our contributing of our means or when it comes to whatever it is that has to do with obeying God, the body must obey. And that gets overlooked sometimes. Now he talks about supplications and therefore we're talking about the petitions from the heart. He also mentioned to Timothy prayers, supplications and prayers. Well, the Greek word indicates an attitude of worship. Literally bending the knee. You're down begging to God 
Because he's the only one that can answer your prayer. He, he's the only one that has the answer. And you're going to him letting him know that. The word expresses the idea of a strong wish requesting the way that we would want things to be. Surely we've all prayed prayers like that. Praying for someone that they would repent. Praying for someone that they could be made well. We all recognize if we're faithful that we pray not my will but thine be done because we know when we're praying for other people their will is involved. God is not going to force them against their will to obey the truth. But we're manifesting our wishes about situations. We pray for this country and the leaders of this country. We pray that providentially things could happen that would turn people back to seeking God and wanting to know His will and do it. That's what we're talking about in our prayers and in our supplications. Then there's intercessions. Well, the word intercession usually is employed when we're trying to obtain something on behalf of another. So you see what I just said would also involve praying for somebody else. I would say that that's what we hear most often when we see prayers, as was noted today, made for the sick. That's the kind of prayer we're talking about. You may have prayers privately offered to God that you're praying about somebody, not necessarily sick, but that they might, as I said earlier, obey the gospel. You know they can't be saved when they will not will themselves to do what the Bible says, but you can pray earnestly for them that they open their eyes. You don't know what can happen in a person's life that would cause them to see things differently from what they saw it yesterday. In fact, I would pray for myself uh, can I intercede for myself through the great intercession? Well, it better be because I do it all the time. That's part of my petition supplication to God. That whatever will make me a stronger Christian and guarantee me heaven, then let it happen. Because this old world is passing away rather rapidly. And I only have one time, as you do, to show God you love Him and have faith in His system of salvation. So you see why that prayer should be fervent, feverishly offered. Going to God because He's the only one I have left. Well, we have people that love us and our families. And we love others. But they can't do for us what God can do. And God can't answer prayer, and He's assured us that He will. Then there's thanksgiving. We just simply give thanks for what God has given us. Material things and spiritual matters above all. When you... And I guess we take this for granted far too often that we were born in America. One thing, besides, of course, many things really happened, but one thing that certainly happened with me in traveling abroad, when you go to the best countries, when you compare and contrast them with the United States and what we have here, they don't, they don't come up to par with what we have here. Now, why did God permit me to be born into this country? When, if you go by the majority of the people who are living, they live somewhere else. Why weren't you born in India? Why weren't you born in Africa or Indonesia or China? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. So what does that make me thankful for? But look at the great obligation upon our shoulders that we were born here because God, by His great grace, has given us the opportunity to be born in this country. Well, that's, we can spend a lot of time praying to God just in thanksgiving that we have this, but also that we might use these blessings to spread the gospel and to exercise these freedoms in contending for the faith and doing what God wants children of God to do. Okay, let's look at the business of the circumstance of prayer. We've just been talking about the character of prayer. This has more to do with where to pray. Well, we mentioned in the worship assembly, we know that one of the five acts of worship is praying to God. Uh, men are to utter these prayers. We won't go into all of that because men, to simply sum it up, are to be in the leadership capacity. And that's simply the reason. Uh, you, we don't kick against that because we want to be in subjection to the Father of lights. We want to do things His way. We're not here to complain and grumble because of we don't work like everybody else. Our job is to accept God's will for our lives. 
That's what it means to be meek and lowly in heart. Those are the people that find rest to their souls. I will therefore, Paul wrote, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, 1 Timothy 2.8. Now, if some people get all hung up, does that literally mean you must do this when you pray or your prayer is not acceptable? Well, there's plenty of people you see on television doing it. No, it doesn't mean that. Now, think about our lesson this morning on what it means to be holy. Have you ever asked your children or when you were growing up and you were called to lunch, dinner, supper, or whatever you called it when you went to eat, and maybe you've been out playing with the cats and the dogs and digging in the dirt or whatever. And you were told to go wash your hands. And Mama says, let me see your hands. In other words, you know kids, they may have not washed them so well. And sometimes you may be sent back and say, no, go wash them again. Or I'll come in there and do, you for, do it for you. Well, the sentiment there is, is that you're clean. And you're clean spiritually. It's not saying you have to hold up your hands or God won't hear you. Nothing wrong with it. I wouldn't fall out over anybody praising God and any more than I would somebody bowing their head. Because the Spirit must be bowed under the authority of Christ no matter what your posture is. Except that we show in our physical posture what's in our hearts. So that's what Paul's talking about. If you look in uh, chapter 2 of Timothy... You'll find that uh, Paul talks about there the matter. Well, let me back up first of all and look at um, the Lord's Supper. There are prayers offered before the bread and prayers offered before we partake of the fruit of the vine. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 25, Paul is giving instruction to the church in Corinth about that very matter. Now remember, they had been taught regarding how to worship God. They knew they were to observe the Lord's Supper. However, when you read the first Corinthian epistle, you find they abused it and misused it and turned it into an ordinary meal. And they weren't discerning the Lord's body. They weren't understanding it was a memorial feast, this do in remembrance of me. So Paul had to correct them on it. And as he corrected them... We learn something about the matter of the prayers. If you think about the whole Lord's Supper, it's to show forth His death till He come again. Specifically, you show forth His death till He come again in the memorial feast by partaking of the bread that He Himself ordained to represent His body with no sin, offered on Calvary's tree as a sacrifice for our sins. Thus, when you see that how the Lord uh, instituted the supper, and you see that He thanked God for that bread, for what it represented, then there's your guideline as to what you should pray before you partake of the bread. And since the Lord partook of the bread before He did the fruit of the vine, then we offer it in that order. And when it comes to the fruit of the vine, then we know it represents by our Lord's own guidance the blood shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. And thus we express in our prayers thanksgiving for the fruit of the vine. So what I'm saying is if you think of the act itself and what the Lord's Supper is, you've got your guidelines as to what you say when you thank God for the bread and when you thank God for the fruit of the vine. The bread represents the Son's body. We should be careful about addressing our prayers to the Father, but it's not the Father's body. And it's not the Holy Spirit's body, neither their blood. It's the Lord who shed His blood for us. And we're commemorating His death. And we do it on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and 7. And we do it as an act of worship in the assembly of the saints. And we do it until He come. So it's part of the worship. One of the five acts of worship. And those are prayers. Well, what about intercessory prayers? You know, it's nothing wrong with the church coming together just simply to pray. We don't think about that much, but we have no problem once a month coming together to sing. Well, what would be wrong with coming together to pray? But in that singing, we have several prayers, don't we? So, whenever we pray in a place conducive to approaching God and showing forth the reverence that ought to be in every Christian, then we can engage in prayer.
So there's prayers around the Lord's table. And we should keep in mind what we're praying for when we utter those prayers. There are prayers such as when we dismiss the assembly, we have a closing prayer. That's customarily done. And that means that we should be aware of the fact that we're dispersing. We're finished with the worship and we're going on our way. And the people leading those prayers ought to think about that kind of thing. So whenever you're praying, you have to think about, for what am I praying? And where am I praying it? The example of Jesus and feeding of the five and the four thousand in Matthew 14, 19 and Matthew 15, 36 uh, is a simple one. But it shows that he was mindful that this came from God and they ex he expressed thanksgiving for it. What about at the meals at your house? Do you pray? What a wonderful time that is to teach the children the importance of being thankful for the very food that they have put before them. Paul says that the food we eat is sanctified by prayer. For every creature of God is good. Now, you may not like it as a particular what's your favorite, but it doesn't mean it's not good. Somebody else probably likes it. You ever eaten baked possum? Well, you may not like it, but I think probably if you, <laughs> if you were hungry enough, there might be a lot of things you might eat. And so the Lord says, if it's put here, then thank God for it when you eat it. Nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5. Now remember, Timothy was to preach that to the brethren, and he was to practice it himself in teaching brethren how they ought to do when they actually prayed such prayers. Yeah, we won't take a lot of time, but just look at the private devotions of our Lord Himself when He prayed. I don't know of a better example than Christ when it comes to anything in service to God. After feeding the 5,000, I've already mentioned that. And when He had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And that was after He had fed them. And after the great multitudes had followed Him, Luke 5, 16 reads, And He withdrew Himself into the wilderness and prayed. Before the crucifixion, Luke twenty two forty one, 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Now, I pause here to interject this in the midst of this study. You're going to have to set up times that you have the allotted time to pray. If you just haphazardly go at it, you, you may not do it. It's like setting up a certain time in the day to read your Bible. Some people might like to read it at night before they go to sleep. Others like, might, might like to read it in the morning. Some might like to read it at noon, whatever. But you have to schedule things. There's not a thing in the world wrong with scheduling, these, doing these good works. We schedule about everything else. There's nothing wrong with making notes as to what to pray about. I think I mentioned a good while ago, one of the things about praying for, well, we'll say the church here since we are the spring church, uh, you got a phone directory, just put the people down in the line and pray right through the phone directory. Uh, there's more, that thing's there for more than just find phone numbers, which I'm sure you've noticed because I imagine in your phone book you've got all sorts of things written down besides people's names. We won't ask you what you wrote down beside them, <laughs> but you may have all sorts of notes. There's something about it. If I can use notes to preach God's word to you and you can use notes in teaching somebody else, why can't you use notes in praying to God so you remember what you want to say and to who you want to say it? Now, may I emphasize this? Uh, the prayers we offer publicly aren't designed to preach to the people. I've heard prayers where that happens. You want to get something off your chest and somebody's not doing something they ought to do or maybe they ought to quit it, and you sort of preach to them in the prayer. Well, you're speaking to God on behalf of yourself and others and all things we should pray for. It's not to make a sermon out of it, and neither is it a scripture reading. We're to be speaking to our Father which art in heaven, hallowing his name. And we have the model of prayer. So we ought to keep in mind just what we're doing. It would help in what we actually do to know what we're supposed to do. Think of Paul and his service to God. In Ephesians 1.16, he says, Cease not to give thanks for you, 
I, in other words, I don't stop doing it, making mention of you in my prayers. The reason that it's obvious, he had some sort of list. I don't know whether he had it memorized or not, but he had some sort of list. In Philippians 1, 4, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. In Colossians 1 and verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Do we pray for one another like that? Paul did. Paul wrote part of the New Testament telling us to do that. And surely we recognize the importance of that. Now, to the content of prayer, what to pray for. Again, I now already mentioned it in our Lord's model prayer. We're to pray to the Father. Notice this scripture, and usually we use it, the one behind me up on the wall, to talk about the importance of having New Testament authority for everything we believe and practice. Well, look at part of that scripture. To God the Father through Him. You notice that? That is, you go through the Christ, our only mediator between God and man, to the Father. So, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God. So, that's a tremendous point. Thanks to God. It's through Christ, by His authority. So, Matthew 6, 9 begins, Our Father, which art in heaven. In Philippians 4, 6, Paul said to the church, Be careful for nothing, which means don't be anxious over anything. You know, I think we could preach on that from now to whenever doomsday is coming, whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now or after we're all dead and gone. And it wouldn't be enough. We, for some reason, cannot get rid of anxiety. Back when I first started preaching, preaching a lot of preachers talked about the aspirin generation because of people having to take aspirin for headaches. Well, I think they finally quit preaching that because there's such a variety of things you take to settle you down now. <laughs> All sorts of things to take anxiety away. But the Lord doesn't want us to be anxious over anything. We're His children. You're special to Him. Wish some of you grandmas and grandpas, if all of us to a degree should remember this, how much do you care for your grandchildren? Why you hover over them like an old mother hen, take care of their every need, and if they bump their knee, you're right over there to help them if you're in the position to do so. Maybe you ought to think of God, your Heavenly Father, that way. He's not going to let anything happen to you if you love Him and keep His commandments. That's not going to work for your good. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Remember, we already talked about prayer and supplication. And notice we've already talked about thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, let your request be made, made known to God. We should have the attitude of when we prayed and put our request to God with an attitude of not my will but thine be done. Let it alone. Paul said of the thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, it was a great irritant to him. He said, I prayed three times. The Lord said, well, it's going to, basically what happened, you're going to have to put up with it. For my grace, my favor is sufficient for thee. Well, there may be some things that if they weren't happening to us and disgruntling to us, they wouldn't keep us where we ought to be kept. Because it was in that context that Paul said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. When we pray that we will learn to depend upon God and His mercy and grace and care for us more and more, then maybe we need something to buffet us to make us realize we can't make it on our own. But God will take care of us if we will but submit to Him. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now notice that let. I've mentioned this at other times where it's found in scriptures. Let means this is your job to do that as a child and trust God to do what he's going to do. Give thanks for the Christ. Give thanks for the good word of God. Give thanks for the nation we're in, for the jobs we have, for our health, our clothing, our food, our families. Whatever our situation is, if we're anchored in the truth of the New Testament and faith, being faithful to God, God's going to see us through. But you know where our problem is. We don't see how he's going to be able to see us through, so we're going to worry anyway. We need to request guidance from God in his providential care. I believe God is in control, ultimately and finally. Finally. 
You know what's been said many times about Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Somebody else summed up the whole book of Revelation in this way. We win. And that's what we ought to think about. If we'll stay true to the words of the New Testament on how we're to think and live, we win. There's never been any doubt of it. When Christ came out of the tomb to die no more, that meant we win based on what? Our love of Him and our faith in Him and our compliance with His will. That's a marvelous thing. So we need to request guidance and His providential care. I believe He can providentially guide me. I don't know how He does it, but He does it. And that's all I need to know. We need to pray for ourselves. You know yourself as a human being better than anybody else does. We don't have the attributes that God has. But we can have and we can cultivate humility. We can find wisdom. And we're to pray for wisdom and to pray for humility. We're to pray for patience to bear up under the burdens of life while we keep on doing what the Bible says. And certainly, we all manage to pray for forgiveness. I want that. I need that. And I also want God to have mercy on me as I am merciful toward others who repent of their sins and ask God to forgive them. And I should therefore do the same. We should be praying that the church, both local and universal, be guided and be receptive to the truth. When it comes to the family, Pray for the fathers and the mothers and the children and their particular roles God's ordained them to be. Be specific in your praying. I already mentioned praying for the government. Well, do we just pray for this government or do we pray for all governments? And any other thing then we should pray to God for to help us and others be faithful to Him. So I'm talking about being specific. That we specify people and we specify situations to God. God didn't just give prayer for us to thumb it in the air and pay no attention to it. It's for your good. It's for my good. And none of us probably employ it nearly as much as we ought to. What about praying for our enemies? Any of you people have enemies? Well, I'd say if you don't think you have enemies, you're not faithful. In Matthew 5, 44, we're taught to pray for our enemies. In James 5, 13 and 14, we're taught to pray for the sick. In Matthew 9, 38, we're taught to pray for more workers in the kingdom of God. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1, we're taught to pray that the gospel will be heralded out. And that means the church be more active in preparing itself to do so. Colossians 4, 3, that God will open doors for the gospel. And in Philippians 1, 9, that love may abound. Well, I promise you, wherever love abounds among the children of God, there's a desire to walk as closely with the commandments of God as possible. We want to trust in God as the Bible pictures Him to us. And then we can concentrate, lastly, on the consequences of prayer. If you look in James, you'll see that there are some physical consequences to prayer. Look in verse 15 of James 5. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now I recognize in that verse you probably had that offered in the miraculous context of the early church because he's actually writing by inspiration part of the New Testament here. But it also has to do with us living today in the church. We need to trust God to take care of things. You know, someday... While we're praying that you get well over some malady, or you're praying that I would get well over some physical malady, it may be in God's mind best that I die. You know, we don't ever think of it that way because we're so oriented to the physical in this life. Well, we'll never get to heaven unless we die. Unless the Lord comes back first. As I say many times, either way, there's going to be a great transition. We're not going to get into eternity and reach the day of judgment and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We're not going to be resurrected into a glorified body in this life. So death's just coming, Hebrews 9, 27, along with the judgment. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, how much is much? Well, it's more than a little. 
And so that tells me if I want my prayers heard, let me walk as close to the teaching of the Bible as possible. And let me trust God to meet out what needs to be given. I said more workers in the kingdom, Matthew 9, 38. Uh, the gospel being carried forth. Do we ever pray that that happens? We pray that the gospel be spread, but folks, it's not going to be spread unless we spread it. God's just not going to do that. When you read 1 Peter 3, 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That tells us God's listening. I'm ready and waiting to hear what you got to say. And more than that, I want you to say it. And I want you to mean it when you say it. And I want you to say it in harmony with God's will. Closing out, I want to end with Luke 18. And I won't read it now. It goes all the way from verse 8 through the first part of, uh, of verse 1 through the first part of verse 8. But the parable of the unjust, jo uh, unjust judge, where the widow wouldn't leave him alone. And think about that for a minute. She badgered him into getting what was done because he got tired of her coming every day. Now, God does not get tired of us approaching him as his child. We've seen that in this study. But what he's trying to say to us, who sometimes just are slow to learn, is that be persistent. Show God you mean it. Remember, we're taught to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Does that cover prayer? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Certainly it does. So how much are we paying attention to the prayers we offer in the worship, the kind of prayers they are, and the prayers we offer in our everyday lives? God wants us to pray. He's given us the model prayer to follow. He's told us all these things to put into our petitions to him, and he's saying, I'm ready and willing. I'm waiting. And so we have a God who can hear all these prayers from all of us and never get anything mixed up, never have anything that is a problem, and never forget anything. He can answer every prayer, and he's promised to do it. And we leave it up to his great wisdom to answer them according to what we really need. Because like little children, sometimes we think we need something, and we put it before God, as I said earlier, as a pious wish in our prayers. But God knows we don't need that stick of candy, so he may give us something else. But whatever he gives us or withholds from us is to get us from earth to heaven if we remain true to living like the New Testament says. So remember the character of prayer, the circumstance of prayer, the content of your prayers, and the consequences of prayer. It'll do us good. It'll make life more livable. It'll help us get through all the ups and downs that come upon all of us. But God cares for his children. We're members of his family. What a thought that is. That ought to be in us every time we consider a study like this regarding prayer. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you to obey the gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. To believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. That's the way to end this day if you're not a Christian. As a child of God, what, is, what have you been doing when it comes to your prayers? Have you neglected them maybe? Well, you know that. You can take care of that in prayer to God, <clears throat> confessing your sins and praying God for forgiveness. It's how simple it is if in all honesty you do that. Why not just be always ready to pray? Pray without ceasing. It's regular. Be always regular. When you get up in the morning, you're going through the day's work, whatever's going on, you can always speak to your Heavenly Father. Now, you notice how we use these cell phones? Man, we're attached to them, talking to everybody under the sun. You don't even need a cell phone or an appointment to speak to God. In your mind, as you're walking alone, as you're at work, as you're in your house, you can always humble your mind and speak according to the model of prayer and offer your prayer to Him. That doesn't take away from the fact that we ought to go into a private place where we can, in great supplication and fervent prayer, pour out our heart to God. But it means that God can always hear us when we approach him with the right attitude and according to his will. If you need to obey the gospel or return to him, we invite you to do so while we stand and sing.